Oh, it's of the clicker. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for that introduction, and it's a it's a pleasure to be here and honored to speak to this group. I don't think I've ever spoken in a setting quite as festive as this one. To be in a hangar with palm trees and Christmas lights. So I only hope that my lecture will do the setting justice. Just at the beginning, I'll just mention just that we at the Church History Department are trying to do a lot of things to make our collections of Latter-day Saint history more accessible uh, through really wide-scale digitization of manuscripts, uh, research grants that we began just this year to help people come to our collections and dive in, uh, consultation specialists to help researchers. Uh, several of us from the Church History Department are here, and if you need information on any of that about how to use our collections, please stop any of us because we'd be excited to, to, um, to share that with you. So my task today is to give us some background for why we're in Fredericksburg. We've now heard about Fredericksburg and heard just a little bit about Zodiac. And I'm going to tell us a little bit more of the backstory. So this year, we in the Church History Department are celebrating the end of the Joseph Smith Papers, uh, the publication of the final volumes. Over the past 15 years, we've published 27 volumes, almost 20,000 pages, and even more contents on the website. For those, those of us who have spent much of our professional lives reading Joseph's mail, it's a bittersweet moment. When I joined the Church History Department, we, we'd only published two of these books. As we worked over the next few years, we sometimes wondered about a question. We'd announced that the Joseph Smith papers would include all Joseph Smith documents. But what about the Council of 50 Minutes? They clearly were part of our mandate, but we also knew that we had not yet received the Council of 50 Minutes from the First Presidency. We did not yet have physical, we did not yet in the Church History Library have the minutes to begin our study of them. The question became particularly relevant as we worked on the third volume of Joseph's journals that cover his final year and mention many of the council meetings. How could we finish this volume if we did not have the council's minutes for annotation? So we decided to delay that, the publication of that volume. We mothballed it for a few years as we pursued that question. The minutes of the Council of 50 had acquired a certain lore among Latter-day Saint historians. They had never been accessible to historians. And confidentiality or secrecy, depending on one's viewpoint, had marked the initial deliberations of the council. What did the records contain? Why had they never been available for research? We knew that church leaders and members had kept the council records confidential. I'm going to show you a few ways that they did this over the years. Oh, well, first of all, this is a, the image of the minute books of the Council of 50. There are three small minute books. Then you can see the title page uh, there. So this is Willard Richards writing in March 1846. To conceal the identity of the council of which he was writing, the last line says here, about 25 men were selected by the council. Now he crossed it out, someone crossed it out, but we can still decipher it. Y-T-F-I-F. -F. Now, that is a code that can be broken. So as, they, as we went along in our history, we got a little bit more innovative in concealing the identity of the council. So this is a letter, George Cannon, to John Taylor and Joseph F. Smith, December 1880. And if you're George Cannon and you want to conceal the identity of the Council of 50, what are you going to do in your letter, your correspondence with Joseph F. Smith? Well, you're going to call it the Council of Canalima. Why? They both speak Hawaiian. And how many people along the trail of the mill in 19th century America speak Hawaiian? So I think that's a little bit better than the YTFIF, but still could be broken. 
So at a certain point, we requested from the First Presidency the permission to publish the Council's minutes. To help them understand the Council, I was assigned along with Ron Esplin to read the minutes and to write an essay about their contents. This was a real thrill to be one of the first historians to examine such an amazing record. After we uh, submitted our essay, we received word that we had permission to go ahead and annotate the minutes, release them as part of the Joseph Smith papers. This is uh, one of the pages of the minutes. If, if you can see, it's, it's beautiful handwriting. It's William Clayton. And here we have a list of uh, the men, all men, who are members of the Council of 50. The standing chairman, Joseph Smith, is here. And then a list of uh, about 50 men, and that's initially where the council gets kind of its nickname. Uh, the men are listed in order of age, because age uh, was important in the Council of 50. When they attended the meetings, Joseph Smith sat at the head of the table, and then they sat in, uh, according to age. And when they counseled about a topic, each man had an opportunity to weigh in. You began with the oldest, and you went around the council. So think about those meetings. <laughs> I think the JWH board should have 50 members. <laughs> Oldest to youngest, all with an opportunity to speak on every topic. And so the meetings often went all day long, as you can imagine. So while the minutes contained elements that could be considered controversial, such as the saints' discussion of creating a theocracy where they could establish the kingdom of God, the minutes illuminated many other topics, including a surprising amount of content on Texas and the Saints' varied attempts to form a settlement there. To understand why Texas becomes such a, of such interest to Latter-day Saint leaders in 1844 and 1845, of course, we need to understand the climate in Nauvoo. Tensions are increasing between the Latter-day Saints and their neighbors. Wherever they'd settled, the Saints had faced these tensions and in spite of repeated pleas for protection or redress, the federal government had not helped them. Disillusioned then with both state and federal governments, many saints desired to move where they could be the first settlers, most likely outside of the United States. But in early 1844, where we're gonna begin our story, they had not yet decided on that option. At, this, at the same time that Joseph Smith was investigating destinations outside of the United States, he announced a campaign for the U.S. presidency and sent out hundreds of campaigning missionaries. These seemingly contradictory activities were part of an effort to explore alternatives to secure their political and religious rights, either within the United States, if the presidential campaign led to some sort of political solution, or outside of the United States, if the political efforts failed to secure their rights. If they took the path of leading the U.S., Church leaders were interested in establishing a theocracy, what they sometimes call the theodemocracy. They wanted to create a separate nation. The, script, the scripturally foretold Latter-day establishment of Zion, holy nation and people to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. As church leaders contemplated these issues, two letters arrived from saints in the Wisconsin pineries who were collecting lumber for the Nauvoo temple in the Nauvoo house. They had almost finished collecting the necessary timber, were writing to propose that their group be sent on a new assignment to Texas. The Republic of Texas had been declared an independent nation in 1836 by Anglo-American settlers living in northern Mexico. This republic on the U.S.'s southern border was a topic of great intrigue during the late 1830s and early 1840s. It was romanticized as a place of opportunity with cheap land. Across the southern U.S., which is where most Texas others came from, uh, would-be Texans abandoned their former homesteads, sometimes leaving only the letters GTT, gone to Texas, on the doors of their deserted houses. This influx of settlers tripled Texas's population between 1836 and 1846. So the interest of the Wisconsin Latter-day Saints was not unusual, except for the fact that they were Northerners. They argued that a Texas settlement could serve as a gathering place for Southern converts. Planters could bring their slaves, and the proceeds from these plantations could provide monetary support. Texas could also serve as a launching point for missionary work to the Southern United States, Mexico, Brazil, and the West Indies. 
these two letters, I'm going to skip ahead just a second. Uh, these two letters, as you see here, had been drafted by George Miller and Lyman White, the main leaders of the Wisconsin Saints. When Joseph Smith received them, he convened a meeting that very evening to discuss them, followed by another meeting the next morning. While the letters proposed creating a local gathering place for Southern converts, Smith quickly expanded past that initial vision. Now, he sought to select a new location where the saints could potentially, quote, go and establish a theocracy that would be the center place for the entire church. Texas seemed a promising place. This is what happens when you mix up your papers. Texas seemed a promising place. Um, oh, sorry. But, but there were other options as well. They're really looking at three different locations at the time. The first is the Republic of Texas, an independent nation at this time. The second is the Mexican territory of Alta or Upper California. And the third is Oregon, which then is disputed between the United States and Great Britain. And so you can see on this map um, some, some different things going on here that the Latter-day Saints and Black River Falls are thinking about coming down to Texas. Joseph Smith is sending out some investigations into Oregon and California, and then he establishes a Council of 50 to look into these options. What do those three places have in common, Texas, Oregon, and California? They're all outside the boundaries, right? So, so that's really the key impulse uh, here. And very early on in the existence of the Council of Fifty, Joseph Smith sends Lucian Woodworth to go to Texas and investigate the possibility of a settlement there. And Lucian Woodworth is not very well known today, but he had uh, he was. Uh, greatly trusted by Joseph Smith. He was an architect of the Nauvoo House, which was a very important uh, building in the city. Uh, he was one of the first uh, Latter-day Saints to receive the endowment outside the temple. Uh, he's, he's trusted both in a, a sort of a strategic sense as well as a, a, a religious sense. And Woodworth makes this voyage uh, to Texas and meets with Sam Houston, and then he comes back and reports to the council uh, of uh, 50. Initially, Houston seems to be not very enthusiastic about Woodworth's uh, offer of bringing Latter-day Saints to Solo in Texas. But Houston was grappling with a couple of key problems at this time. One was that uh, the Republic of Texas had a lot of financial problems. The second was uh, that they faced threats uh, from uh, Mexico, which had never recognized Texas independence, as well as in, in native uh, tribes in Texas. And so quickly, Sam Houston came around to the view that a large influx of Latter-day Saint settlers could help with both of those problems. Uh, they could provide financial resources, and they could also serve as a buffer, perhaps, between the Republic of Texas and Mexico, or the Republic of Texas uh, and indigenous groups. Uh, so he soon tells Woodworth that he will do all he can with the Texas Congress to uh, get approval for Latter-day Saint settlements uh, there, notwithstanding the negative reputation of the Latter-day Saints among much of the American population at this time. When Woodworth returns home uh, to Nauvoo and reports on the mission of the Council of Fifty, the Council asks him to return and attend the Texian Congress to help bring about the Saint settlement there. It's unclear and probably unlikely that Woodworth actually goes on this second Texas mission. Uh, the council also authorized 25 of the Wisconsin Saints to go to Texas as soon as possible so they could start planning crops for a future settlement. The Council of 50 closely followed news and rumors regarding Texas, Oregon, and California, seeking information on the quality of the land and the political situation in each. Rumors swirled in the national press about the potential annexation of these locations. 
which was a topic of great public interest in light of Americans' expansionist desires. In his presidential campaign platform, Joseph Smith had advocated for the incorporation of Texas and Oregon into the Union, as well as potentially Canada and Mexico. In contrast to many contemporaries, Smith sought to annex locations that asked to be annexed, uh, so by invitation rather than by conquest. In spite of Smith's support for Texas annexation, though, Latter-day Saint views were complex and evolving during April 1844. By April, multiple members of the Council of 50 hoped that Texas would remain outside of the Union. In his meetings with Sam Houston, Lucian Woodworth had sought to dissuade the Texas president from seeking annexation. In a late April letter from Washington, D.C., Orson Hyde suggested that maybe it was for the best that strong political force is opposed to Texas annexation, suggesting that it might be God's will that Texas not enter uh, the Union. So at the same time that you have council members out as campaigning missionaries, presumably advocating for Joseph Smith's platform that calls for the annexation of Texas, you begin to have real doubts among many uh, people in Nauvoo whether that was actually a good idea and perhaps it would be best if Texas was not annexed after all. At the same time that the Council of 50 was sending Woodworth to Texas, the group took additional actions to prepare the way for a potential Texas settlement. They drafted a petition to Congress delivered by Orson Hyde which requested permission to gather up to 100,000 volunteers to help defend Texas and Oregon from foreign invasion. If you thought the Nauvoo Legion was ambitious, <laughs> this is on a whole different scale. Key purpose of the, of, the of the petition was to ensure that a potential Latter-day Saints settlement group heading to Texas or Oregon received the protection they felt they had lacked uh, previously. By having their own federally sanctioned defense force, they could protect themselves and other frontier settlers. The petition included a request for Joseph Smith to be commissioned an officer in the U.S. Army so that he could lead uh, the group. But any proposed legislation at this time regarding Texas was controversial, with worries about the precarious balance between slave and free states and about the possibility of war with Mexico. Senator James Semple of Illinois felt that the church's position would be perceived as an attempt to claim these lands exclusively for the saints. Semple thought that politicians would be more reticent to propose Texas Oregon legislation during a presidential election year out of fear of, of affecting the party's electoral prospects. Furthermore, Senator Semple argued that Congress would never permit Joseph Smith to be made a member of the U.S. Army. So Orson Hyde took that uh, request out of the petition. Uh, perhaps he had forgotten that Joseph Smith had told him that he wanted the petition passed exactly as written or not at all. Joseph had said he did not care whether Congress would grant the petition or not. It would serve to goad them. When Joseph learned that Orson had uh, ignored his uh, earlier advice, he told Orson exactly what he thought of that action. A strong rebuke came from the Council of 50. Joseph Smith met with the Council of 50 for the last time on May 31, 1844. But during Smith's final four weeks, two offers were sent to him from individuals who hoped the Saints would settle in Texas. The first was a letter from John Walton, who was a former mayor of Galveston, who offered to sell the Saints 60 leagues, about 260,000 acres, in northeastern Texas. He had maybe learned of Smith's interest in Texas from Houston, who he knew. Uh, Walton was clearly a land speculator, and land, specu and land speculators were influential in Texas at this time. He argued that in Texas, the saints would find no dense population to contend with, no bigot to oppress, no overwhelming power to crush you in your infancy. He said Texas was a place that was as yet free from the civilized weeds of superstition, oppression, and pride. He claimed the saints would at once acquire the controlling vote of Texas and that they might aspire to and obtain any office in the Republic. He may be going beyond what Sam Houston was hoping for here. But he said, if a man of energy like Joseph Smith was the leader of Texas and commanded such a force as you could bring into the field, 
he could conquer Mexico and make Texas unsurpassed in wealth, power, and resources by any nation on the globe. Now we can all imagine that Walton is perhaps overenthusiastic about the reception the Saints may, might have received here in Texas had they moved en masse. After all, they were Northerners, and Texans had worked very hard over the last decade to ensure that Texas remained uh, a slave republic. We're not even quite sure if Joseph Smith sees Walton's death before his letter before his death. The letter says June 28th on it, which may be the day that it was received in Nauvoo, uh, or it may be the day that they were planning to answer the letter. But in any case, Joseph had died the day before. A second offer did reach the Latter-day Saint prophet before his death. On June 1, Wall Southwick wrote a letter to Smith. He wasn't a Latter-day Saint, but he said they'd met seven years earlier when Wall Southwick was a clerk at the Bank of Monroe, which had entered into a bank partnership with the Kirtland Bank, Kirtland Safety Society. He explained that he'd recently been, been involved in financial and political activities in Texas, and he said he could serve the Saints' interests uh, there. We don't know how Wall Southwick learns of the Saints' interests, uh, but he seems to be picking up on uh, be picking up on some intelligence or rumors, or at least guessing correctly, that Joseph Smith might be open to going to Texas with the Latter-day Saints. We don't know if Smith answered the letter, but Wall Southwick showed up in Nauvoo on June 20th, seeking to confer with Smith. When they met, he told Smith he had learned that a cannon had arrived at nearby Warsaw and that there was great excitement at far west of Missouri against the Saints. His sharing of these threats seemed to uh, have brought him into Joseph Smith's confidence. And uh, while Southwick stayed with Joseph and Emma in the mansion house during the days before Joseph left for Carthage. Southwick became known in, Te in Nauvoo as a Southern gentleman who wished General Joseph Smith to buy considerable property in Texas. Though Smith's re own reaction is unknown. Though Southwick had only just arrived in Nauvoo, he did participate in the final events of Smith's life. He traveled to Carthage spent the night of June 25th in the jail with Smith and other church leaders and visited the jail over the next few days. After Joseph Smith's death, he continued to press the Texas claims or the Texas interests with church leaders like Willard Richards. But then he vanishes from the historical record as quickly as he had appeared. So at Smith's death, um, Texas still seemed like a promising location for Latter-day Saint settlement. Uh, nevertheless, um, although Smith had been interested in establishing some kind of settlement in Texas, he had been less certain that he wanted the Texas to become a new gathering place. In April 1844, he had told the council, I have no disposition to go to Texas, but here is Lyman White wants to go. As one of the Wisconsin, as a, one of the authors of the Pinery Letters, White was a committed advocate for settling in Texas. However, Smith's personal preference seems to have been for the church headquarters to remain in Nauvoo, if, if at all possible. And then if they had to go somewhere, that seems to have been undecided. The day after Smith's death, um, the Saints also learned that their uh, petition uh, for the 100,000 troops uh, had been rejected by both Congress and President uh, John Tyler. So at Smith's death, then, both Texas, California, Oregon are still all in the saints' minds as possible uh, locations. Lyman White is the key to the next part of this story. He joined the church in 1830 been expelled from Jackson County in 1833, marched with the Camp of Israel in 1834, was imprisoned with Joseph Smith at Liberty Jail, served various missions. He'd clearly shown loyalty and devotion to the church. In 1841, he became a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and then received the assignment to uh, lead the settlement at, uh, at the Wisconsin Pineries. And that was not just sort of a tangential assignment. The Pineries were essential to the construction of various homes in Nauvoo, but especially the temple and the Nauvoo house, and those two buildings that Joseph Smith saw as so important uh, to his mission. Now, Lyman White 
um, wasn't at the in the initial meetings of the Council of 50, shows up on May the 3rd from Wisconsin. And that happens to be the date that Lucian Woodworth gives a very positive uh, report of his meetings with Sam Houston. When the council met again on May 6, White, George Miller, and Lucian Woodworth were assigned to help uh, the Wisconsin Saints move to Texas. The council minutes indicate that White suggested that the Wisconsin Saints go to Texas immediately, which led the council to give him this assignment. In White's own recollection, it was Smith who brought up the idea of the Pinery Saints going to Texas and then gave White and Miller the assignment to go there. So there's very much a different of emphasis as to where the idea is coming from uh, there. White, this dis White, in his view, thus described his call to Texas as a personal prophetic mandate from Smith. And even after Smith's murder, he said that he was determined to carry it out. At a meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve in August 1844, White made it clear that he wanted to start his journey towards Texas. His fellow apostles were less enthusiastic, but agreed he could go if he only brought Pinery Saints with him to not take too many people away from the construction of the Nauvoo Temple, and if his group went to Wisconsin north before heading south to Texas. Brigham Young told White that he might need to speak a little against his going for fear that the whole church to a man would turn out. So there's a real concern about Lyman White leading too many people away from Nauvoo at this critical moment. White agreed to, the, to these conditions. But the relationship between White and the rest of the apostles quickly soured. Young believed that White disobeyed the instructions to not take too many people with him. When he sent a messenger to White in September with that message, <coughs> that complaint, White responded that the Lord would not accept of the Nauvoo Temple when it was built. So clearly there was a, a disparate religious vision at this point. At the church's October 1844 conference, Brigham Young called White a coward for heading to Texas, but White at that moment was not removed from the 12. But in February 1845, when the Council of 50 reconvened for the first time after Joseph Smith's death, White, <clears throat> who was not present, was unanimously rejected for, quote, following his feelings. In a March meeting, Heber Kimball criticized White for leaving Nauvoo prematurely and contrary to counsel. In April, the Council of 50 sent a letter to White's company, which was then passing through Iowa on their way to Texas, urging them to delay traveling until after the completion of the Nauvoo Temple so that they could receive the endowment. But White and his company still pressed on to Texas, where they founded the town of Zodiac and other communities, as we've heard. Even as White pressed on to Texas, the interest of the Council of uh, 50 in the settlement there was diminishing. <coughs> as it appeared, Texas would be quickly annexed to the Union. From the beginning, one of the main appeals of Texas was that it was outside of the United States. One sign of the Council's diminishing interest in Texas was that the letters from the Wisconsin pineries, which were previously treated like founding documents of the Council, and they were read repeatedly uh, to the council, were no longer read. The murders of the Smiths had also dampened interest in going to Texas as council members felt an increased sense of tension toward the outside world and more urgency to depart Gentile nations altogether. Just going <clears> to <throat> grab a drink of water here. very long walk. <sighs> so at this time in the Council of 50 discussions, there's also a lot of discussion about Book of Mormon prophecies about indigenous peoples. Uh, prophecies that were told that Lamanites, in their view, Native Americans, would convert and join forces with the church against the Gentile world. Feeling that the fulfillment of these prophecies was imminent, council members argued that the church should stop preaching to the Gentiles and focus rather on native tribes. The church would then dwell among Native American peoples and raise up God's standard to the nation. So intriguingly, the council considered a different kind of Texas settlement. During spring 1845, Brigham talked 
Brigham Young talked often of converting Native American tribes and then moving the saints to dwell among them. The Comanches in northwestern Texas particularly caught his attention. Perhaps Young's interest in the Comanches was partly due to their fame as a powerful native nation. His reputation may have led Young to see them as a, a potential ally if they needed to protect themselves against the Gentile world. He suggested uh, that Lucien Woodworth travel to northwest Texas as an emissary to the Comanches to determine the feasibility of settling in that tribe's territories. So think about that dramatic shift in Lucien Woodworth's mission. First to Sam Houston, and now to the Comanches, who uh, are the sworn enemies of the Texas Republic. So just how Latter-day Saint distrust of the outside world, world grew in the aftermath of the Smith's death, with a corresponding growth in, malaria, in mil millenarian interest in Native American peoples. The idea of sending Woodworth to the Comanches was never again mentioned in the council. It appears that he never actually went. But the council did send five other men on a western mission to meet with the Comanche and Cherokee nations, as well as attend a large gathering of native nations that would supposedly be soon, uh, would supposedly uh, be held in Council Bluffs, Indian Territory. They set out from Nauvoo in late April 1845. Around that same time, the Council of 50 receives another proposal involving Texas uh, from a guy named William P. Richards, who writes to church leaders suggesting that the federal government, to stop tensions between the Latter-day Saints and their neighbors, should create a, quote, Mormon reserve, an area set aside for the exclusive use of the saints. Orson Spencer, as an assignment from the Council of 50, wrote back to William Richards, asked him to start lobbying for that, and he suggested four possible locations, Wisconsin, Oregon, Texas, or Indian Territory, just west of Missouri. The lobbying for the Mormon Reserve, of course, never goes uh, anywhere. But it does suggest that the council is remaining open to a variety of options that might bring peace or protection or let them uh, leave their immediate situation in Illinois. Now, despite Brigham Young's interest in the Comanches of Texas and Orson Spencer's request for a Mormon reserve in Texas, the idea of going anywhere in Texas began to receive vocal opposition from Council of 50 members in 1845. And this really contrasts starkly with the discussions of the year earlier. Alman Babbitt says that in Texas, the church would find the Southern spirit predominant, which has harassed us all the while. Texas' settlement by Southerners alarmed him, considering the saints' previous persecution from Southerners in Missouri. In a later meeting, Babbitt declared that he would not be for going to Texas, for there are already there many of those who have mobbed us and the filth of all creation, adding that he wanted to go to a place where the vulture's feet has not trod, no matter how far the journey. After that lovely description of historic Fredericksburg, I feel bad about reading this quote about the filth of all creation. I, I don't endorse it. Even Joseph Young, Brigham Young's brother, speaks vocally in the Council of 50 against any idea to uh, go to uh, Texas. And even council members who were previously promoters of a Texas settlement had lost interest. George Miller, who had signed the letters from the Wisconsin Pineries, had been one of the most vocal supporters of Texas settlement in 1844. But now, he, he never talks about Texas uh, as an option again, even though... He still has um, some thoughts about creating a southern gathering place uh, for the saints, but now he's thinking uh, of going further down on the Gulf of Mexico into, uh, into Mexico uh, itself. Now, as interest in Texas declined, the council directed their attention toward the Mexican territory of Alta, or Upper California. Alta, California encompassed the modern states of California, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona, as well as portions of Wyoming and Colorado. In the early months of 1845, John Taylor composed and then expanded a song called The Upper California. You can see it here in one of the Saints' hymnals in 1851. The Upper California, well, that's the land for me. 
It lies between the mountains and the great Pacific Sea. The saints can be supported there and, twa- and taste the sweets of liberty. And now in Upper California, oh, that's the land for me. Perhaps we might sing the second verse together. <laughs> no, we're not really going to sing the second verse together. The Upper California was sung repeatedly at Council of 50 minute, at meetings in 1845, just as the Wisconsin Pinery Letters advocating a Texas settlement had been read repeatedly in the meetings in 1844. Uh, and it really, that I think indicates this real shift towards Texas is now annexed into the United States. Uh, we're not seeing possibilities there. Let's focus on uh, the Upper California. So the Council of 50 does not meet between May and September 1845. When they reconvene in September, some members of that Western mission had just returned to Nauvoo. They had met with uh, representatives of multiple tribes, several of whom were reportedly friendly and seemed to understand what is going on among us and are ready to render us any assistance. But it does not appear that any member of the Western Mission had met with the Comanches in Texas, even though they were the tribe Brigham Young had been most interested in. Nevertheless, council members did not seem too concerned that their emissaries had not made it to the Comanches. In fact, they did not give uh, much attention to the report from the Western Mission at all. Although Young commented that the council had learned considerable of the feelings of the Indians towards us and the prospect is good, that is all anyone in the council had to say about the matter. They then spent the rest of that meeting in, on September 9th, making plans to send a company west next spring, somewhere near the Great Salt Lake, and later work our way to the Bay of the St. Francisco. Since the council had last met around three months earlier, they had firmly committed to settling in Upper California. One important development was the August publication of John C. Fremont's report of his 1843 uh, to 1844 exploration of the West. Young had previously been very wary of the idea of settling beyond the Rocky Mountains due to the remoteness. But Fremont seems to have convinced council leaders that the barrier of the Rocky Mountains could be crossed in multiple places without too much difficulty. Thus, the decision to go to Alta California led to the abandonment of the idea of settling among the Comanches, which heralded the end of the Council of Fifties' interest in Texas. Even though the idea of establishing a Latter-day Saint gathering place in Texas was never carried out by Joseph Smith or Brigham Young, it formed a crucial part of the deliberations and activities of the Council of Fifty. The letters from the Wisconsin Pineries advocating for it catalyzed the formation of the Council. Discussions of Texas and Lucy and Woodward's secret mission were key parts of Council deliberations in, in 1844. Although interest in Texas had faded by 1845, the council still thought of a Mormon reserve or settling among the Comanches. Even so, the council's early interest in Texas lived on through Lyman White and George Miller. White continued as leader of the Texas settlements until his death in 1858. Uh, He had arrived in Texas in November 1845, founded the Zodiac uh, community in 1847, and then received news of his excommunication by Brigham Young and the rest of the apostles in 1848, so a number of years after he arrives in Texas. George Miller, who eventually also rejected Brigham Young's leadership, briefly joined White in Texas in the late 1840s. Thus, both men who had authored the Wisconsin Pine Ridge Letters eventually found themselves in Texas. Those settlements that Lyman White established left a notable imprint on the history of the regions of Texas, where of course we are today. I'm happy to take some questions. That's kind of what I wanted to share with you today. If we don't have questions, we can end early too. Okay. I can't I can't see you. Okay, now I can. Can you say that again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With the Joseph Smith papers. Oh, so so the question is, um, uh, are the documents in the Joseph Smith papers, are they searchable? Have they been transcribed? 
So if you go to the Joe Smith Paper website, josephsmithpapers.org, uh, you'll there find not only transcriptions of every document, but also the images of every document. So you can check our transcription against the original if you want. Um, yeah, so it's totally searchable. We, uh, just in the last year or two, we um, search capabilities weren't great a couple of years ago, and we've revamped the, the search and the site. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage anyone doing any research on Latter-day Saint topics, Mormon topics in the 1830s, 1840s, to use that search ca uh, capability at the Joe Smith Papers. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Please. Thank you. I missed in your presentation any reference to Dr. John Goodhart, whose uh, relationship with Stephen Austin, or Hogus Austin, Stephen's father, gave rise to him and certain Stephen Dorchester, and then those of those who met God, which uh, uh, John went and met God with Joseph Smith when he was going through and told him to take the bread, take the loaf, and drink the cup. I think that. Uh, the lack of inclusion of John Burton Heisel has now been remedied. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so, so the question was um, that John Burton Heisel, who is a member of the Council of 50, has a relationship with the Austin family and is encouraging, uh, is very knowledgeable about the settlement of Texas. And in, in, in a longer version of the paper, I do talk about that just a little bit. And, and it's interesting. So um, Burton Heisel never mentions those connections in the Council of 50 meetings, never uh, never brings that up, but that is that's uh, a really interesting connection too. So thank you. Please. Uh, so the question is. Uh, uh, the, the, how many people were on the Council of 50? So the, the slide I showed you was just the first page of their membership. So the, the membership hovers around 50. Sometimes it's 45, sometimes it's 55. It, it's, it's, the 50 isn't like a super key number, but it's generally around there. So the next question is, at what point do they start talking about the Utah Basin? So it's really late in this process that they zero in on uh, Utah, what we know as Utah, or the area of the Great Salt Lake, or the Utah Basin. It's really um, uh, in kind of fall, 1845, then in the Council of 50. I mean, I mean I'm trying to think if there's any references to it in spring uh, 45. Certainly not in 1844. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, and of course, Alta California encompasses Utah. And so they are talking about Alta California, but in 1844, it's unclear what area of Alta California they're talking about. And it's really, uh, that's kind of summer and fall of 1845 that they really begin to focus in on uh, the area around the Great Salt Lake or Utah Basin. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Please, go ahead. I'm not sure about that. So, um, so the question is, was Lyman White kicked out of the Quorum of the Twelve before he was excommunicated in 1848? Uh, I'm sure there's an answer to that, but I don't have one right at this moment. Does anyone else want to stump me? It's super, no, this is not super hard. Please go ahead. Who was it? Yeah, it is a great nickname. Who was it that called... Lyman White, the wild ram of the mountains. I'm sure that knowledge is here with Alex Baugh. It's Phelps. It's Phelps. Phelps. Yeah, he writes it in December of 45, and so I think people think, oh, the wild ram of the mountains, yeah, it kind of gets off. He was up in the pineries, I guess, so he kind of felt like that was where he's at, and it's just kind of a, uh, uh, an anomaly. Just yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so this is, a, this is a fun game because if you stump me, then we will just collectively answer the question. <laughs> this is awesome. Please, right here. Why did the name Zodiac come about? How did the name Zodiac come about? Again, I'm going to crowdsource this answer. <laughs> Does anyone know? 
I don't know. Please. I feel like these questions are just perfectly set up. This, this has been amazing. This is great. Any other questions? Kind of in the back there and with the black shirt. Uh, it was Wall Southwick. His first name was Wall. And his last name was Southwick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, that question was just clarifying the name of the second person who wrote Joseph Smith with an offer of, of land. It was Wall Southwick. Yeah. You can find that letter on the Joseph Smith Papers website. Please, go ahead. They, so the question is, um, the Council of 50 sends this emissary to Texas. Did they send anyone to Mexico? They did not. Yeah, so the idea of settling Mexico does arise uh, in, um, in the area that we know as Mexico today. It does arise in spring 1845, but they never do send anyone there to kind of be on the ground. Please. You are correct. And so we have determined that Wall Southwick was not a Mormon, but his great 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 grandson is. A bishop, a bishop apparently. Yeah. Nope. That's interesting. Thank you. Please, back there. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that that's really clear in the presidential platform. Uh, I, uh, um, if, there's, if, if there's a clear connection in the platform, maybe someone here knows, uh, has, has read the platform recently, between the emancipation of slaves and the annexation of Texas uh, as kind of a, a, a place where freed slaves could live. I don't think that connection is there. Okay, it's not. I like it when I'm right. <laughs> Please. So, does that put the Joseph theology in between the three and they going out and creating their own kingdom? Is that not part of this conversation at all of why then Catholic is, is uh, treating Catholics less so than Catholics in America? I mean, how can you comment on that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know in terms of Lyman White's own kind of understanding and perception of that theology. Uh, so it is within the Council of 50, and then that would sort of be another uh, discussion. Um, it is within the Council of 50 that uh, Joseph Smith is received by other council members as a prophet, priest, and king, uh, right? Which, uh, and there's a lot we could discuss about that and how they understood that. But in, in terms of, uh, does Lyman White himself see him, you know, going to Zodiac as some sort of fulfillment of uh, being a, a, a prophet or a priest or a king. I, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, good point. Anything else? Okay. That's still the case. Yeah, no, so he, he does seem to be kind of a, a shadowy historical figure, right? He just kind of appears on, 
on, on uh, the scene. So the, all, the, all the thinking we have on that is uh, published in the um, most recent documents volume to the Joe Smith papers, came out a couple of months ago, it covers the last month of Joseph's life. Um, but there's not, there's not too much beyond what I've said here. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or should we call it? Oh, one other question. That is a good question. Women are very absent from the Council of 50. So, I'm sure there's women in Texas, but in terms of like, <laughs> I'm sure there's women in Texas. But in terms of like, was Lucy and Woodworth meeting, you know, in terms of like, it, the Council of 50 is a very kind of male story. Right, and I, I remember when we first uh, announced the Council of Fifty uh, that we were going to publish the Council of Fifty documents. We did a plenary session at the uh, at, at the Mormon History Association, um, and one of the questions was, "Well, what do we learn about women from the Council of Fifty Minutes?" And um, there are two women mentioned in the minutes of the Council of Fifty. Emma Smith is mentioned after Joseph's death, and not totally a positive way. And then uh, 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 a woman named Aunt Peggy is mentioned. And this is, this is kind of interesting. So uh, if, uh, Aunt Peggy is the name of a vigilante group in Nauvoo in spring 1845 who is driving dissenters from Nauvoo. The entire story includes uh, what they call privy dust. Uh, it's not really an amazing story, but we are told from other historical records that Aunt Peggy is a very severe woman. So it's a very male story in the Council of 50. Great question. <laughs> Any other questions or should we call it there? We'll call it there. Thank you so much.